The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us together confess our Christian faith through the words of the Apostle. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. Hallelujah! 
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The particular focus for this morning comes from our, our uh, epistle reading from 1 John 3, especially verses 14 through 18. And if I was to give it a title, at least right now, it would be Loving That Brother. Good Shepherd Sunday. Welcome. It's a great imagery, isn't it? Over and over again in our gospel reading and in our hymns, we see Jesus as the good shepherd, the shepherd that fulfills all the promises that we recited when, at the beginning when we responsibly read Psalm 23, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. It's a great imagery. Jesus our Savior, our Shepherd. We, the sheep, the church, safe in his sheepfold where he protects us. And as you think about that, and as you apply that imagery of being a sheepfold, being the sheep of his flock, what comes to mind? How do you picture these sheep as they're gathered together in the sheepfold? Well, they're all clean. They're all nice. None of them are buying or bleeding out of turn. They're making way for one another. They're not shoving against one another as they go to feed. They're perfectly behaved lambs of the perfect shepherd's flock. Right? That doesn't really sound like the church, does it? Not really. But don't we per... per picture in our minds the perfect congregation, the perfect worship service, the perfect church. We all have that ideal in our minds, don't we? If we were to picture it, the perfect Lutheran church, what would it be like? Well, every Sunday would be filled with perfect people. None of them would have those characteristics that get on each other's nerves. You're laughing. There'd be that, there wouldn't be that person that sings really loud and out of tune behind you. There wouldn't be that person sitting next to you who maybe should have showered before they came but didn't. There wouldn't be that person who afterwards in the fellowship hall speaks loudly, speaks over top of you, seems to know it all. It'd be a perfect service. It would be one hour exactly, maybe a little less. It would be the perfect mix of traditional and contemporary worship tunes that satisfy the needs and desires of everyone, played at perfect speed, sung at perfect speed, and oh, by the way, the pastor would keep his sermon 10 minutes or under. He would be entertaining. He would be energetic. He would be one that challenged you and taught you, and lifted you up, never knocking you down. And, well, I don't think that that congregation exists anywhere this side of eternity. Because the church is not a gathering of perfect people. The church is God gathering broken, sinful people who need to be in the presence of their good shepherd. And the people who are involved in the worship, both the worshipers who contribute their part, the worship assistants, and even the pastor are as well broken, sinful people. That's the reality. Now, if we weren't church, if we were some kind of other group, what would we do? Well, we would want the perfect gathering to attract people when they come in. What we used to do, what was one of my jobs, at least what they wanted me to do when I was a manager at Hillers, was to get rid of the undesirables, to make them want to leave. And sometimes that attitude that is outside the church filters its way into the church. 
There are people who get on our nerves that we wish wouldn't come if we were honest with each other. If we were to do that, think about it, where would it stop? Where there's that one person that you have in your mind, when they're gone, who's the next one? The bar keeps moving down, moving down, till how long before it gets to you or it gets to me? Because as a broken, sinful sheep, there's things that I do that get on your nerves. That's not what Jesus has in mind when he calls us the sheep of his pastor and he the good shepherd. John in his epistle is addressing how we should relate not only to our good shepherd but to one another. And he starts out with this. We know that we have passed out of death into life. A simple truth. We were born broken, sinful human beings. We were born to die. Born apart from God, without faith, children of wrath. If nothing changed, our bodies would continue on to temporarily die. With the result, we would die eternally apart from God. Jesus loves you like a precious little lamb and could not stand that thought could not stand that future for you. So he came down and gave his life for you, took your sin and died upon the cross to remove it from you, and then gave that death and that resurrection, the gifts that he earned for you, to you in your baptism. In your baptism, you crossed over from a life of death to real life now that leads to eternal life to come given the Spirit to keep you in that faith. That's who we are. Broken, sinful lambs that actually have passed out of death and into life. And as a result, Jesus tells us that we should love the brothers. With the same love that he loved us. Came and gave his life for us Not when we were all cleaned up. Not when we were saying, yeah, Jesus, I'm ready for you. I guess I love you. I guess I'm interested in you. But when we hated him, didn't want anything to do with him, we're just like those people that were in our Bible study on, on Wednesday evening. Children of wrath, yet he came and sacrificially gave all that he had to love us. That's how we are called to love one another. How are you doing with that? I'm doing a pretty poor job at it myself. And this is the scary part in this epistle. Whoever does not love abides in death. Kind of makes me stop and look, how am I doing at loving other people? It's important to remember the source of that love what that love means to us. He knew that we would struggle to love one another, yet he gave his life for us. Loved us so much that he saved us from death, saved us for eternal life, laid down his life for us. So this love that we're to have for one another is a sacrificial love. We should be willing to give of ourselves up into the point of our life for our brother and sister in faith, for those that are sitting here in the same room as you, and also those who are not in the same room that confess faith in Jesus Christ. And there's this. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That hits hard. I'd like to tell you that through my life, I never, never have anybody that I hate. There are certainly people outside the church that I could say that I hate, but what about inside the church? Uh, there are times when I might have hate toward 
my brother or my sister. When they do things that get on my nerves, when just who they are, their characteristics of who they are, grind on me. It's not just a matter of me putting up with them saying, well, that's who they are. I'll let it slide. Letting it slide means you still have hate in your heart for them. And hate in your heart means that you're a murderer. It's what Jesus taught in Matthew 5. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment, and whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. These words condemn me. And I imagine they condemn you there tough words. Here's where our doctrine as the Lutheran Church comes into play. These words are words of law. You are not saved by the words of law. You are condemned. Now in all actuality, John is preaching this to the church, to the assembled group of believers, those who have confessed their sin and confessed their Savior. That makes this the third use of the law, which is given to guide us as Christians. How are we to live out our Christianity? How are we to live as sheep of the flock? How are we to live with one another? But it's a fact that even when the law is being used in its third use to guide us, it always condemns us. It always has that second use. The Holy Spirit moved John to write these words, in part, to crush my heart and to crush your heart. Not to leave you there, but so that he could come with the love of Christ and heal it. He condemns us to keep us in what's called repentant faith. A faith that keeps confessing no, I don't live as I'm supposed to. I don't meet the demands that Christ makes of me, and I never could. But he met those demands for me. And he gives me credit because he lived the perfect life for me. And he forgives me for when I don't. And because of that, even as I sin, I look to my Savior and receive his love and his forgiveness, his stamp of approval, his declaration that even though I act like a poor, miserable sheep and I treat others shamefully, he declares me to be in right standing with the Father because of all that he has done, not what I do. That's the truth. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the truth who you are as a baptized child of God. You are forgiven. I don't care how many times you've been a mean and nasty sheep to somebody else, you are forgiven, as I am forgiven. He loves you so very much. That's why he called you here. And he breaks your heart to build you up so we can begin sharing that very special love that Christ gives us with one another. We are to know we've passed from death to life. We no longer live a life headed to eternal damnation. Our goal and our end is eternal life with Jesus Christ. And on the way, he calls us to love one another. These words are written as a reminder to place before us a goal. This is where we should be headed. This is what we should be doing as Christians. As forgiven Christians who have received Christ's love, we need to begin and to continue working on loving one another. Knowing that it doesn't happen perfectly. We're faulty. We're sin. We fail. Yet when we confess, we receive his forgiveness 
and are picked up to continue on, to learn from our experiences, and to love maybe a little better next time. That's repentant faith. Yes, I've sinned, but I have a Savior. I'm forgiven. I get up and I go again. Not condemned, but forgiven and cleansed, renewed in my faith through word and sacrament to live out that faith, to have the goal of loving others like Christ loved me, to look and see, does my brother have a need? Certainly we're asked to fill temporal needs. People among us that have temporal needs like transportation or help with their yard work, or anything else in their lives that we can help with, we're certainly supposed to do that, even if it means that we need to give up some of our time, talent, and treasures. But along with that, when you think of time, we're also to give some of ourselves. To sit and listen to those people that grate on our nerves. To not run the other way, but to reach out with them with the same love that Christ reaches out to us who always bends a listening ear to us, even when we prattle on, even when we ask for things we're not supposed to, even when our prayer is tinged with anger, he still loves us, and he still forgives us. And he calls us to show that love, not just with words, but in how we act, in the work of our hands, in the time that we spend, in using our talents and our treasures. It's a challenge. Welcome to the real sheepfold here in the church. Welcome lambs who are not perfect. Neither is your under-shepherd. I feel your pain. I know what it's like to be crushed by some of these words, yet I know who my Savior is. And I know that he loves me and forgives me. I know that that love is really beyond understanding. Yet it's mine and it's yours. And he breaks my heart to build it back up, to mend it, to become more like my Savior, better at sharing his love with others. And I'll do that and I'll commit on leaving here today that I'm going to love better and then I'm going to fail. And then I'm going to look to him and ask his forgiveness and know that I'm forgiven. And the next day I'm going to fail again. Maybe even later that day, I'm going to look to him and cry out with my heart and hear his words, you are forgiven. I love you. Go love with the love that I give you. That's the life of sheep in the sheepfold. The love that the shepherd gives us. It's not perfect yet. But you are declared perfect sheep by your faith. And we're headed someplace. We're headed to a place where there will be nothing but perfect sheep. In a perfect sheepfold. With perfect worship. And it'll last forever. But until now, in our imperfection, maybe we are primed and ready to help those who are not perfect out there. Who might come and visit who might be comforted to see people that don't think they're perfect, but know that they're broken, and know that they have a Savior that heals brokenness and forgives. That's a great place for now. Welcome to his sheepfold. Welcome, lambs of the Good Shepherd. He loves you.